All right, welcome to Lights, Camera, Action, Creating Engagement with OER Materials. Uh, this will be uh, presented by Richard Gosling from Houston Community College. Mr. Gosling currently serves in higher education as Interim Dean of the Social and Behavioral Sciences Division of Houston Community College. He has also served as chairman of the economics department, where he worked as a professor since 1989, teaching in the traditional classroom, dual credit at local area high schools, and through distance education. In addition, he served in a leadership role as the economics program coordinator. Lastly, Mr. Goslin is the founding board member and first president of the National Economics Teaching Association, which began in 2005. Dr. Richard, you have the floor. All right, very good. Well, um, welcome and, and thanks for joining me this afternoon. And as I was mentioning to, to Michelle, uh, I only have a handful of PowerPoint slides because this is more of a show and tell than anything else. And I also really wanted to encourage um, you know, audience participation. So if, if folks have questions, it's okay to interrupt. In fact, I prefer that you do so. Um, so don't hesitate uh, in that regard, all right? So uh, I want to get started by just saying a couple of quick things um, about OER and my own transformation, uh, so to speak. For many, many years, I would say for a couple of decades, more than a couple of decades, I was really a strong believer in commercial uh, textbooks and commercial work. And I was always suspect about uh, OER. And uh, I, as chair, a number of years ago, I was invited by a good friend of mine, uh, Nathan Smith, who's the chairman, uh, at the time was the chairman of the Department of Philosophy, but then eventually became our OER coordinator to come in and, and you know, see the other side, see what OER has to offer. And so slowly but surely, I began to warm up to the idea, so much so, that I applied for a grant <laughs> for the Texas Higher Education uh, Coordinating Board grant and got two grants, one to develop a uh, microeconomics course and one to develop a macroeconomics course. And I think through the actual uh, creation of these materials and seeing what was out there, that really kind of changed my view uh, in a big way. And that doesn't mean that I'm not still a fan of commercial uh, products but it does mean that I consider OER to be definitely a very credible alternative and certainly a way of uh, <clears throat> being able to help students access materials on the first day and also be able to have affordable materials. In fact, nothing more affordable than FREE, -E, right? <laughs> Which is what we have here. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, I, I adopted uh, two, Creative Commons license books through OpenStax, which of course is right here in my own backyard at Rice University. And I use the macro book and the micro book uh, to develop my course. So that served as the background for the course. Uh, that was the, the, the you know, sort of the backbone, I should say, for the course. But in addition to that, I started thinking, I need to start developing ancillary materials, that is supplementary materials. And so I started to roam around the universe and to see what was out there. And so I found some really cheap tools that provided some really big results. And I think you'll be uh, pleasantly surprised about what some of these things can offer you. Some of you folks may already be aware of some of these products. I'm not going to necessarily walk through each one of them, but I will uh, discuss a couple of them and take a, a peek under the hood, so to speak, in my own course. Uh, so there's Jeopardy Labs. Jeopardy Labs, professors can get a subscription to that for $20 for life. <laughs> and then once they have it, that's it. They never have to pay again. And certainly students never have to pay again. And I'll make a point of showing you uh, what that looks like. Uh, and again, Michelle, if you see anybody typing in the, the chat window, make sure to let me know and I'm happy to answer their questions. Um, the other uh, product is uh, Kahoot, which many of you may be aware of. Uh, I certainly know that this is very po popular in K through 12. 
but it's made quite a bit of inroads in, uh, in, in, in colleges and universities as well. And there's a couple of other favorite tools that I like to use, both synchronously and asynchronously, one of which is called Quizzes, another known as uh, Socrative, and then the last one known as uh, StudyMate. So the two that I will probably be spending more time on will be Jeopardy Labs and, and StudyMate, all right? So um, now that you got to see sort of the panorama of what's available, um, you know, let's, let's just jump in and talk about what the advantages are. I think the, the first thing really to, to uh, understand here about these uh, tools and are what they all have in common. Uh, most of all, the, the base versions are just completely free, uh, with the exception of Jeopardy Labs, of course, which is $20, but that's a lifetime membership. That's about as close to free as you're going to get. Um, upgrades are usually low cost to the professor and almost always free to students and source. That's the key, right? But the other big thing that I think is important about all of these tools is nearly every one of them has a community of users in which you can share content. But what's great about that is it means that you're not on the hook for creating material from scratch. If you wanna do that, you certainly can do that, but you don't have to because a lot of other folks have created very uh, nice material that you can incorporate in your courses. Of course, the key here is curating that material that is looking for it, making sure that it suits your needs. If you're talking about using multiple choice style questions, which many of them have, then of course you wanna make sure to edit the question stems and expect, inspect the detractors and make sure that the correct answer is coded correctly. I mean, that's just called do, doing due diligence, right? And then <clears throat> I think the third aspect is huge really, because it means that you're not always having to create the content, you know, all the way from scratch, and you can borrow from other, borrow from other folks, and uh, that's really, I think, almost the clincher uh, with with many of these tools. All right, let me see if I can advance one more slide. Uh, another thing that's beautiful about OER, whether you're talking about using ancillary tools, or whether you're talking about <clears throat> you know, using OER materials like maybe an abandoned textbook. And believe it or not, there are formally copywritten materials which have been abandoned. And it's just a question of getting out there and looking for them. Uh, interestingly enough, on the University of Michigan's website, I managed to find this book that had been, that was previously copywritten, but was free from copyright and was released into not the public domain, but in the Creative Commons license. And it was interesting that they stripped the book of the title and they stripped the book of the author by request of the author. Well, it's kind of interesting that when I was reading the author's bio, I figured out who he was because <laughs> I had remembered his work. And it turned out, unfortunately, this was a professor who passed away. Uh, he had uh, a debilitating disease that was terminal, uh, but that did not stop his spirit. He continued to do great work, um, but he left something in posterity, which is his great work, his textbook. And from that book, uh, I was able to create other OER materials like creating videos and stories from the beautiful stories that he wrote all, of course, giving, you know, giving credit. Um, of course, I couldn't say the name of the author because one of the restrictions in this interesting creative common license is that it, it ostensibly said, do not mention the name of the author. Of course, uh, they don't mention the name of the author in the book, but I knew who the author was. Um, and then when I created uh, video content, I started to build channels uh, in my, uh, Houston Community College EduTube site, which many universities have an EduTube site that they use or something similar to that. And then from those channels, develop playlists, which I'll show you in a moment, all right? So 
that's it for the prepared part of the talk. All right, so I don't have any more PowerPoints to dazzle you with, but I do uh, have some content to show you uh, inside my courses. And I'll show you how easily some of these uh, products uh, can be deployed. Uh, it's uh, quite remarkable how quickly you can kick into gear uh, without really a lot of effort. And so the learning curves on many of these um, third party softwares that I'm talking about, much of which are free, at least the base versions are, are uh, exceedingly simple to use and are, the learning curves are pretty flat. Meaning you can be up and running in a matter of days and you're producing content almost immediately. And that's a really beautiful thing. So I'm gonna stop for just a moment because I've been, I think, rambling on for a good 20 some odd minutes now. I wanna see if there's any questions in the chat. Is there anything in there, Michelle, right now? Do you see any comments in the chat? Not at the moment, no. Okay, all right. Well, if there are, I'll, I'll be happy to stop. But since there aren't any, I'll take that as permission that I can move on, right? Okay, so let me go ahead and now uh, stop sharing my screen for just a second. And then I will restart sharing my screen, but showing uh, my course. All right. Is that okay? Are we coming? Is everything going on okay, Michelle, so far? Are we good? Okay. So let me share my screen and let me show you my, my course inside my learning management system, you know, known as Canvas. So sit tight while I go ahead and do that. And I should have it showing up on the screen here momentarily. And voila, there we go. So uh, let me uh, go to the modules section just to show you how I've embedded some of these into the course, all right? So let me, my, my courses are totally built on modules. That's how I expect my students to navigate through my, through my course. So they start off with these Excel videos and uh, the use of mathematics and economics. And then, you know, chapter one, and in the chapter one, it's all structured. You know, videos, reading, uh, the quizzes, uh, Excel assignments. Um, there's a built-in review, which, by the way, is also Creative Commons license. Uh, it turns out that someone was good enough to write a beautiful PowerPoint review for every single chapter in this OpenStax book. And, of course, I found that through uh, the consortium. And so that was very nice. And so I was able to put it right in there. And I'll show you what that looks like in a moment, but I want to bring you up to a typical uh, module, which is uh, the chapter two module. And you can see right under here, we have interactive exercises. So there's StudyMate, Jeopardy Labs, and Kahoot, all right? So let's start off with StudyMate. Uh, StudyMate, by the way, if you just go to studymate.com, S-T-U-D-Y, M-A-T-E dot com. You can register for StudyMate absolutely for free, regardless of whether or not your college or university has an institutional license. The only difference is that you'll have to link your content to the chapter if your university or your college has not adopted StudyMate and integrated it as a part of their LMS, all right? Now, if they have done that, well, then a lot of heavy lifting has already been done for you, so that's great. But if they haven't done that, don't despair because you can still use StudyMate. And I wanna show you how beautiful this product is. All right, so let me click on StudyMate right now. And it should populate on the screen now. Michelle, are you able to see all nine of these little tools? All right, so that's what the students would see. I didn't even have to worry about creating these icons. These icons were automatically populated for me. So there are things called a fact card, and I'll show you what they all look like in a moment, but I wanna review them first. There's a thing called flashcards, which as the name suggests, they're electronic flashcards. There's a pick a letter where it helps students learn the material in the course. Fill in the blank, same purpose, different technique. Uh, matching, crosswords, a glossary, a quiz, and even a challenge, which is very similar to the Jeopardy tool that I explained to you a moment ago. But this challenge, of course, is associated with 
study mate, all right? So let me show you what one of these would look like. If, if a student were to click on, let's say, flashcards, you know, boom, right? Right there, it says, hey, a country has an absolute advantage in those products in which it has a productivity edge over other country that takes fewer resources to produce a product, right? This is nice, right? Um, when, when you're done, you can simply uh, click off of it. It tells you how many out of the seven facts you've learned and it keeps track of it. Um, now, these are all what I would call, um, instead of uh, summative tools, these are more formative tools. And they're formative tools that I've chosen not to have counted as a grade. Uh, not everything has to count as a grade, right? <laughs> And certainly, I think it takes the edge off for students to know that, hey, I'm studying, but I don't want to have to worry about whether there's a score attached to what I'm doing. Now, there might be a score, but that score is only for the student's use. All right, so that's fact cards. And then, of course, these are flashcards. And you can actually, there's a little button on there to say, hey, don't show me this one again. That means you've already learned it, which is very nice. You can flip the card so you can see what the, what the term was, right? Flip it back to see the definition and just roll through all of those, which is really nice. And you can see how it's keeping track of them. Six out of eight cards, seven out of eight cards, eight out of eight, right? Beautiful, right? Come back, you have the nice pick a letter, right? So here it is, this is a country that can consume more than it can produce as a result of specialization in trade. So you can actually start typing in letters if you think you know what it is, right? Now, it, nope, look, see, I got a D, so I'm so far so good. But then, you know, if I were to type the letter Z, it, it's gonna take away points because Z is not one of the words, right? So you can just, you know, run through each one of them. And if you give up and you're not sure, you can either ask for a hint or you can go here and say, hey, look, I just give up and I cry uncle. What was it? Oh, gains from trade. That's very nice, right? Um, so that's pick a letter. And then of course there's fill in the blank, you know, a country that can consume more than it can produce as a result of specialization in trade. You can simply type that answer directly into that chat and you can click submit. And it'll say incorrect. Oh, there's too many letters. So I click show gains from trade. So I had the letter S there instead of uh, gain from trade, right? But you get the main idea. It's very nice. And then, you know, there's matching. So you can literally, uh, you can view the, 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 the item in the top section and then you select the ma matching answers uh, from below uh, and where you can actually just show those answers as you're moving along, right? And then there is also a glossary. If students just wanna, you know, just look at the glossary to see what those definitions of those terms are, if that's the way they like to study. Or create a, a, a quiz, right? Uh, and these are simple multiple choice quizzes. Again, they don't count for a grade, but they do keep track of your progress as you're moving along, right? And you can certainly choose to pass up questions if you want. You're allowed to put graphs in them if you want, which is very nice. You can even embed a video. Now I've chosen not to embed videos, but you certainly could. And then uh, the last one is challenge. And this is something that you could do if you were conducting a face-to-face -face class, let's say online on a schedule, uh, which of course is very popular nowadays with our COVID crisis, where we're meeting at a particular day and time with our students. You could divide the class into two groups, you know, uh, color purple, uh, the purple group and the green group. And then, you know, you could actually uh, at, have, have them say, I'll take mixed topics for 300, please. You know, NAFTA has made everyone in both, uh, has made everyone in both Mexico and the US better off, right? And you would choose it and whether it's true or false and it would, signify whether purple got points or green got points. Very interactive, clearly creates a, a lot of student engagement if you're doing this online uh, in a uh, 
in a uh, you know simultaneous uh, way uh, where you are online together with your students, right? So that's StudyMate. Now, if you want to take a look at what StudyMate looks like from the outside, in other words, from the authoring perspective, let me go ahead and do that now. So I'm going to go straight into StudyMate. And there it is, there's StudyMate. And as I mentioned, you can create your own account and create your own work. So I've created 21 projects in macro, 20, well, I'm sorry, 19 projects in, in micro. So there's 40 different projects that I've created. If you expand them, it'll show you all the products, uh, all the projects that you've made. I, I've made a project for every single chapter in the textbook that's tied with the OpenStax book that I adopted, right? Um, so you can go right in there. And if I wanted to, let's say on demand and supply, I can edit it. So you click on the edit feature and there you go. That, that, that's where you've actually added your facts, right? Uh, you've added all your, your, your facts and you can edit them. You can delete them if you want. And then in terms of uh, your, your facts, you can also add in your, your definitions and then you can uh, add in your questions for your fill in the blank. And this is just a really beautiful tool because now you'll notice that each one of these chapters has its own special link. Remember what I was saying before, that if your institution has not adopted StudyMate as part of your LMS, don't worry because you can still use StudyMate for free just by visiting studymate.com. The only thing you'll have to do is embed that link directly into your course. And that's not really a big deal, right? So uh, that's nice. There are, are beautiful little tutorials. If you don't know how to use it, um, use StudyMate. So you know, there's get started with StudyMate, there's sharing and following, there's importing and copying, and then there's moving projects from older versions to StudyMate. And I think the StudyMate people have really done just a marvelous job at making this a very accessible tool that is really just pretty easy, I think, to use. So um, that's that on on that front. Let me go back. And, Richard. Uh, yes. Um, do, sorry, uh, the, the comment moved. <laughs> um, are you, you mentioned that the study made was free, correct? It is. Um, can you still see the student effort uh, and their scores? Um, you, you cannot, right? I mean, well, let's see. If, if, you, if you had StudyMate that was embedded as part of your LMS, in other words, if your institution had adopted it, then the answer would be yes, all right? Um, but if they're using it uh, remotely here, like I'm doing now, in other words, it's outside the, the course, right? Um, Let's just click on this edit feature just once again. Um, there's a little feature in there that talks about uh, usage. Uh, so here it's just really anonymous usage. So here I see total visits to the project by anyone anywhere is 300 and total activities that were played by anyone anywhere is 217. So no, you're not looking at their scores. And no, you're not looking at individual students, but you are able to get an idea about whether or not your product or whether or not the activities that you're designing are having any impact in terms of being used, right? But uh, yeah, that's, you could say a downside to having the free version, um, but of course, you know, that's an institutional consideration. I hope I've answered that person's question. Was that from the chat window, Michelle, or was that your question? Yes, that was from Wade Cornelius. Oh, okay, very good. Um, so, Jennifer yes. Star was, uh, sorry, uh, ask. Uh, so you enter words and definitions, and the application designs all the activities automatically. Yeah. So what? Here's the kind of cool thing, right? Is that once you've done this, so let's let's go back. So let's say. Let's go to, go to a micro section, right? Well, let's come to 
a, a chapter on uh, supply and demand, which there's quite a bit of activities there, right? When you click on the edit feature, yeah, correct. So it's going to query you for entering in facts, entering in definitions, entering in questions. And then I can add more if I want. You see how there's that button for adding more? Now, the, the neat thing is that once that's done, that's helping StudyMate be able to design those nine activities that I showcased at the beginning. But you're not having to make them because it's making those activities based on the, 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 the populated material that you already gave them, right? And so if you wanna know, you know how to actually do this, if you just look here, for example, it says multiple choice questions can be studied as a quiz or a challenge, single answer questions as flashcards, fill in the blank, pick a letter, crosswords, right? So it's asking you to show a little bit more there. And this, this is what it, it, it is telling you. So anytime you give it facts, those will produce fact cards, fact cards plus. Anytime you give, give definitions, those will allow you to get flashcards, fill in the blank, matching, pick a letter, crossword, or glossary. And then anytime you provide questions, those will allow you to do or populate a quiz or a challenge. So in other words, if you don't put questions in there and all you put are facts, well, you won't be able to get any multiple choice questions. All you're gonna get is facts and definitions, which is fairly kind of limited, right? But what I think was interesting is the fact that students can choose to use the mode of their preference, right? Uh, of what is helping them the best, right? Out of each of those. I hope I answered that one satisfactorily. Are there any more questions in the chat? Yes. Uh, can each type of activity be individually enabled or disabled? Ask uh, Corey Anger from USC. Oh, that's a that's a good question. Um, and you know what? You may have stumped me on that one. So uh, I, I do know that the facts automatically populate those fact questions and those definition questions. I don't know whether or not you could suppress them. Or in other words, that's what you're probably getting at, right? Maybe you don't want to display all nine tools. Um, I don't know. <laughs> You, you, you asked me a question I don't have an answer to. So that would be something to investigate. So I'm stumped. Thank you, Corey. Yeah, that was a good, <laughs> that was a good question. But you know what? That's, that's worthy of consideration to go back to the drawing board and find out, right? So right now, I can't tell you. <laughs> so what is it, it is, and this is a kind of a mix of uh, Dina Kerrigan's question and I mean, Minakshi Berry, I'm really sorry on my pronunciation, um, but uh, is are your materials available to other people, all learners? They are because, yes, they are because as a condition of the grant, so whenever you write a grant for the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board you, and you, you know, you, 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 you write up an OER grant, uh, one of the things that you're required to do when you conclude the grant is that you are required to make these things public. So one way you can do it is through the LMS. So in the LMS, there is a way of publishing that content, not just privately within your institution, but making it available for others to see. And also a lot of these ancillary materials can be published separately too through that consortium, uh, which is very nice. So in anybody, any, uh, Texas uh, professor, community college professor or university can access that portal and peruse the content, right? And, and that's the duty of anybody who wins a grant is to make these things available. And usually most of us, because we're academics, we wanna always try to improve on them. So we go in and we edit them and we clean them up and we add more content. Um, now, this was a grant I won back in 2018 uh, I've probably added content since around 2020-ish, and then right around January 2020-ish is when I kind of knocked off and didn't do any more adding to it. I wasn't really contractually obligated to do any more, but 
that's kind of the nice thing about the academic community and OER is that you can do that. So I hope that answered the question on that front. Erin uh, Cassidy asks if the uh, materials you've shared from study made from micro and macro are in the OER Texas repository. They are. Yeah, absolutely. They are. Yeah. And so if you go there and for some reason you can't find them, email me because that would be a shame. They're supposed to be there. And I remember, you know, I mean, what happens is when you finish a grant, you know, they're not done with you yet. <laughs> Before they cut you that final check, they want to make sure, hey, uh, have you published it to the repository? And that they've done a really nice job there in structuring it. So, um, but if anybody has any trouble seeing it or finding it, you know, please let me know. Uh, but they shouldn't. Uh, in fact, a couple of times I'll get queries, you know, where somebody will thank me for something or they'll ask me a question. I don't get a lot of stuff like that, uh, but every now and then it can happen where somebody can reach out to somebody who's won a grant uh, if they've had a question about the material that they've posted there, right? So yes, all, all that stuff should be there. That is Anything fantastic. else that's in the chat mm -hmm. window? Yeah, no, it's great. I mean, that's what's terrific about the community, right? Is that it's open to everybody. I mean, that's why the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board started this. In fact, I think now it's really kicked into high gear. I know at HCC, for example, we had three faculty members this year that won multiple awards. Um, and we've won awards every single year since they've started it. Um, and, you know, there's, I know that OER just five years ago was just this thing, you know, faint little movement that was not really a big deal. Oh, it's a big deal now. Uh, and and it, if it can convert somebody like me, who is a hardened commercial user, that's saying a lot, right? So, and it doesn't mean I'm no longer a commercial fan, a fan of commercial books. I still am, but I'm a really big believer in trying to improve access, it's particularly with regard to, you know, open educational resources that it can be provided to our dual credit students in which it would be very nice for them to have those materials on day one, right? So they're not having to worry about go going and getting the code and getting the book and all this nonsense. Um, so that that's a very uh, satisfying part of doing this kind of work. Anybody else got anything in the chat window? Well, they're saying that you're good and awesome. Do you want to hear oh. that? <laughs> well, thank you. I, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, that's, no, I, I appreciate the compliments. You know, What's really kind of neat is it has created a beautiful community, right? Because any of the people that are, yes, it's true that people get paid to do this work, yes. But it's not like they're making huge bucks off the deal, right? I mean, uh, there's plenty of other ways to earn money besides writing a grant for the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. But what's nice about it is the kind of attitude that the academics who publish this content have. And that is, it's about sharing, right? It's about uh, letting other people know what you're working on. And then also being receptive to constructive criticism. Hey, have you considered this? Would you like to try doing this? And part of the reason why we're having this conference is so that we can learn other ways to deploy the content that maybe we hadn't anticipated using. You know, maybe it never occurred to some people in this room that you could take Creative Commons license books and turn videos out of some of them, which is what I've done, by the way. Oh, and by the way, that's one of the things I wanted to show you, right? Which I've Go ahead. Yes, which is you can create videos from some of this material. So let me let me go there now on HCC Edutube and uh, pull up my account. And hopefully it's broadcasting on the screen here in a moment. Uh, should be populating momentarily. If not, you're gonna let me know, I know. <laughs> All right, so let me log into my account and I'm gonna show you something called My Channels. Now, whether or not your university or your college is using EduTube or not is not really the point, All right? If you're using EduTube, fantastic, that's great. If not, there's other ways of hosting things, right? 
You can host things on YouTube. You can host things on Vimeo. And I actually am a big Vimeo fan. I like Vimeo because there's no commercials uh, and there's no fluff. That way you don't have to be embarrassed that students have bumped into some inappropriate content while viewing yours, right? Which is nice. And that's why I like Edutube because there's no content, there's no commercials. But I'm gonna click on my channels and it should populate on the screen in a moment. I've just created two channels, that's it. Let's keep it simple. 2301 for my macro class, 2302 for my micro class. And uh, let's just click on the 2302 one, for example, right? So you click on 2302 and it's gonna take a little while for it to populate. And what you're gonna notice here as it, as it opens up is you're gonna see there's 243 media content. I know that sounds like a lot of media, but most of these videos have an average 